Yo, what is going on, guys? Sorry for my brief hiatus. It's been a busy week. All the same, Technology March is on, and I am once again back to discuss it. So now that we finally have this whole new GPU every week business out of the way, we're going to have some time to do more in-depth analysis of those GPUs, of course, which you will see more videos on from me very soon. But we're also going to have more time to cover other technologies as well. And speaking of which, today we will be discussing another important processor inside all of our systems. We're talking about CPUs. In this discussion, I'm going to cover the recently leaked Ashes of the Singularity numbers for Zen, and we will look at what Intel and AMD have in store for us in terms of their upcoming platforms, features, advantages, performance versus one another, and more. But before we get too far down that rabbit hole, let's take a minute and look at where these two companies have been. As some of you may know, AMD have always been a much smaller company than Intel, and granted, they have been getting their teeth kicked in lately. As far as CPUs are concerned, their products have neither adequate chip design, nor do they have a competitive way to fabricate those chips to be able to really compete with Intel in the higher ends of the CPU market for consumers. But this was not always the case. Back in 2005, AMD had not only become competitive at the top of the CPU food chain, but they were arguably ahead of what Intel was doing in their technology. The company had massive design wins with the Athlon 64, leading the charge into the 64-bit era of consumer computing, and then again leading the way into using multiple cores on the same die with the Athlon X2 CPU. So their CPU standing at the time really was excellent, especially in the face of the just terrible products from Intel at the time with the Pentium 4 and the Pentium D being basically the redheaded stepchild, AMD bulldozers of the day, they just ran at very high frequencies to achieve the same level of performance as the Athlon 64. They used more power, they created more heat, and they just weren't as good of a chip design. But to this end, AMD, at a fraction of the size and value of Intel, had captured roughly half of the CPU market, which is a high mark that stands for them still today. Now, shortly after achieving this, in 2006, AMD did put that money to good use, and they purchased ATI for $5.4 billion. Ah, uh, Ruby, it's a pleasure to see you again. In doing so, they now had access to all kinds of different technologies and could make products for markets that they'd never been involved in before, and even markets that didn't yet exist, such as those being opened up by their next innovation, the Accelerated Processing Unit, or APU. These contained both CPU and GPU resources on a single die, and by doing this, by integrating both technologies that AMD had available to them in a very unique position, they were able to not only provide low-cost integrated solutions for laptops, and entry-level desktop machines, but they were also able to forge a path of basically dominance in the still-booming gaming console market. Now, while that is a rich and impressive history, the PC market as a whole has really lost momentum over the last 10 years, and this has really affected AMD's bottom line. But of course, the market has given way to a lot more products than just desktop or laptop PCs. People carry around devices on them all day nowadays, such as cell phones, tablets, and even little low-powered, low-cost Chromebooks are shipping more than ever before. So you couple this with some bad business moves by AMD, some poor designs uh, as far as the CPUs have been concerned, and AMD really do find themselves behind the eight ball with regard to their struggling consumer CPU business. And in a major way, AMD really do need a win with their upcoming and seemingly revolutionary Zen architecture. AMD themselves have not been shy about their alleged advancements either, claiming massive gains in instructions per clock and power efficiency, 
over the previous designs, citing Zen as being 40% faster in terms of IPC is a very bold statement indeed, and while we can expect Intel to tick and talk their way along, this is all leading up to a very interesting battle. With basically an updated architecture over Skylake, Intel will be launching their brand new Cabby Lake CPUs and AMD will be launching their new Zen-based Summit Ridge CPUs, both set to launch sometime in Q4 of this year. With true volume availability really starting off in early Q1 2017, Intel's Cabby Lake CPUs will come in dual and quad-core configurations and will likely come with and without hyperthreading enabled depending on the SKU and the price. Now one nice thing about these chips is that they will all sync in to a current socket LM51 motherboard. That's right, these chips will likely work in your current motherboard with only a quick BIOS or UEFI update. Of course, Intel would prefer that you went out and bought their new quote-unquote Gen 2 socket 1151 motherboards that will be using the new 200 series Z270 or H270 chipsets, both of which will have 24 PCIe lanes, up from 20 on the first gen Z170 and H170 boards, which I absolutely hate by the way. 20 PCIe lanes is just not enough when 16 of those can be used by a single GPU. If you toss in an SSD that uses PCIe lanes, now you have only one GPU and only one SSD and all your lanes are gone. So I don't even think 24 is adequate in my opinion, but that's what they're gonna go with. In addition to that, this platform does obviously support DDR4, which does provide greater memory bandwidth over DDR3 and just a little bit of increased latency there, but not really a big deal for most applications. It does also include access to the PCIe 3.0 interface for interfacing with GPUs, and again, other memory bandwidth hungry parts like SSDs that will go into those PCIe slots themselves or interface through an M.2 slot, what have you. They can also come equipped with SATA Express, which is essentially worthless at this point because no one actually makes those parts, at least not yet. Uh, but they do have other newer I.O. features as well, such as USB 3.0, 3.1, Type-C, Thunderbolt, etc., which are all great. And it's very good to know that if you're buying a new board, that it can accommodate future peripherals and newer technologies, such as external GPUs possibly, that may make use of those higher bandwidth external buses, and so on and so forth. Now, on the AMD side, we're looking at one unified socket coming down the line here in the form of AM4 for all of AMD's upcoming Zen-based consumer CPUs, and even prior to that, their APUs, the direct successor to the long-in-the-tooth and very long-in-service AM3 Plus platform. AM4 will feature platform features very much in line with what Intel will be offering at the time. We will get access, of course, to DDR4, which is a first for an AMD platform, PCIe 3.0. Again, a first. All these are first for AMD platforms. And a yet to be disclosed number of PCIe lanes, but I hope it's more than 20 or 24, I'll tell you that. We will get all the latest input and output interfaces as well, just like Intel set up with things like USB 3.1, Thunderbolt, M.2, etc. These boards will actually see service before the launch of any Zen-based CPUs, the first one out of the gate being Summit Ridge, but they will actually be used before Summit Ridge or Zen-based CPUs appear with AMD's Bristol Ridge APUs being the first in line to take advantage of the new platform when it arrives later this year. As mentioned earlier, Intel will be launching Cabby Lake in an array of variants as always, ranging from lockdown dual cores to fully enabled and unlocked quad cores with hyper-threading, just as we've seen on previous generations of their chips. With that tick and talk we've come to expect from Intel, we should see a roughly 5-10% to uptick in IPC in terms of clock-to-clock -clock performance and maybe very small gains in efficiency, but remember, Intel are not making a change at this time in terms of fabrication. They will still be using their 14 nanometer FinFET process, which is a fantastic process. I've been on that for a while now, and the move to 10 nanometers is not far off for those guys. But for the first time in a long time, 
AMD will be using the exact same 14 nanometer FenFET process, albeit different location in terms of fabrication, uh, using global foundries and not Intel's own fabrication plants, obviously. But AMD will at least be temporarily caught up in terms of the node and the manufacturing process front. But what about all this talk about massive gains to performance and massive gains to efficiency? Well, I think the efficiency gains should be a lock for AMD. With the shrink down to 14 nanometers from 28, a lot of these gains for efficiency will be due to the lower amounts of leakage and just a tighter, more efficient inner working of the chip thanks to its smaller die size. Now, other gains have been made by AMD and actually are already present in some form or another in their current excavator core-based Bristol Ridge APUs, for instance. These cores have been worked over for efficiency improvements since the base architecture launched way back with Bulldozer. And although they're still being made using the old 28 nanometer process, they're already way more power efficient than they were previously. So you pair those two things together with any additional improvements sure to be found in Zen, and they should be just way, way more efficient. Now, we can actually see this in planned products coming from AMD, with the first Zen cores to see the light of day coming in the form of AMD's new high-end consumer-grade Summit Ridge CPUs. They're planning on coming out swinging with four cores and eight threads at the entry level and eight cores and 16 threads in some models as well. We will still see an estimated power target below 95 watts, all while packing twice as many cores and threads at the top end compared to Intel's Cabby Lake. They are actually estimated to use the same 95 watt TDP or less as those Intel based chips, again, with only four physical cores and eight threads. So that should be insanely efficient. And that's all fine and good for efficiency. That's great gains for AMD in that area for many reasons surely but what about performance how will these two stack up clock for clock and in more highly paralyzed workloads that can make use of all those cores and threads well we do have these leaked ashes of the singularity benchmarks to go by for a start obviously these were done comparing very early runoffs of the new zen based chips and they sport a lower than expected clock speed than what we're actually going to see upon their launch, hopefully much lower. But regardless, we can see some really nice gains over their previous generation architectures with respect to performance per clock, and we see some highly competitive numbers in relation to the fourth generation of Intel chips being shown here in the Core i5-4670 and the Core i7-4790. Now, keep in mind that the AMD 8350 in these tests is actually an eight integer core and four floating point core part. The i5 is a four core part for both and the i7 has four physical cores, but enables the execution of both an extra floating point or an integer based calculation per clock to basically run two at a time on a single core, giving this chip the ability to process eight threads on a four core chip, AKA hyper threading. Now, all of AMD's new chips will have this as well. Uh, we do not currently know what version or core count of the assumedly Summit Ridge Zenbase CPU seen here is being shown. What we do know is the clock speeds are relatively low as this is a way pre-production and still a very early tap out of these chips. But we also know that no matter what, we're going to be getting at least four cores and eight threads on any Summit Ridge Zen-based CPU from AMD, just like Intel's top-end Core i7s are going to see. So I'm not going to make any further assumptions here about core count or what this chip indeed may be, but I will get on to some more interesting fiddling with the numbers here so we can see where these new chips will fall in line with Skylake CPUs that are out currently, as well as the new Cabby Lake CPUs coming soon. So to do this, I've gone ahead and looked closely at the only metric that we currently have to measure performance, the Ashes of Singularity Standard Settings 1080p test. 
Now, I'm fairly confident or at least hopeful that these numbers are relatively accurate because I'm attempting to extrapolate them out a bit more here for comparison's sake. So using the RX 480 as our standard issue GPU, I've gone over to the official website of all the recorded benchmarks. And what I've done here is to look up all of the current top scores for the CPUs benchmarked here as well as the Intel Core i7 6700K. I've taken a look to see if these numbers are consistent in terms of percentage differences to one another. And from there, I've been able to plot out where all of these chips present and future will theoretically pan out against one another, at least in this one test. So looking at the top score from all of these CPUs with an RX 480 as our common denominator, and keep in mind that GPU has a pretty steep falling off point around 1400 megahertz in terms of its maximum overclock. So the GPU variance here should be fairly low. We do see an average of 142% increase in frame rate from the leaked results for both fourth generation Intel Core chips. And for some reason, we only see a 117% boost in quote unquote real world performance for the FX 8350. Now, whether that's due to a lower GPU clock uh, for that guy running that test or another variable is unknown, but even if we take the average escalation amongst all three of these chips at 134% and apply that to Intel's latest and then look at it versus Kaby Lake as well. So I've gone ahead once again and pulled some real world numbers here for the i7 6700K and we see that it's roughly five FPS or about 6% faster than the fourth generation i7 after all this math has panned out. And we can use this same formula to get us about where we expect the Kaby Lake i7s to fall. Now, given that they will maintain the exact same core count and thread count, and assuming that they'll achieve similar clock speeds, which is a pretty safe bet, considering they're using the same manufacturing process, we add in to their benefit 10% uptick in IPC, and we come to an estimated performance of 76 frames per second for the new Intel Kaby Lake CPUs. Interestingly enough, when we upclock the Zenbase CPU here from 3.2 to 4.2 gigahertz, whatever core count and thread count variant this may be, we wind up at the exact same approximate number of 76 frames per second. So that is just, I mean, damn guys, it's, it's just coincidentally, it worked out very, very close here, obviously, and very tight. And this took a lot of math on my part, some of it creative. Uh, if you girls or guys see any holes in this ship, feel free to walk me off the plank down below in the comments section. But if this comes together and makes sense to you too, please let me know. I'm trying to provide you guys with some stuff that other channels aren't, and I sure hope you like it and maybe find some of this stuff insightful. Again, this is only really a math test for me and done for fun to see where in theory we'll wind up with these chips in terms of performance. I see no benefit going either way in terms of their respective platforms. Socket 1151 version two against AMD's AM4. Although I'm sure we will see some differences shake out as we learn more about both of these platforms in the near future. As far as pricing is concerned, I am hoping and betting that we will see AMD finally putting some fire back to Intel's little toes. And while we may not see Intel give away their high-end CPUs anytime soon, it just might be enough to drive their prices down into the realm of reality for some people that couldn't afford them before and just give consumers a better value from Intel. Um, either way, it's always good to have options, especially when the two look so close in terms of performance, power consumption, and features. Again, both companies will have bigger and badder chips coming out intended for the quote unquote server market. But of course, we all know what enthusiasts are known to do with those. And again, I am super excited to see what becomes of AMD's new Raven Ridge Zen and GCN 4.0 packing APUs that are due out later next year. Those two architectures for CPU and GPU design should make for some just ultra efficient and super fast and powerful CPU and GPUs tied together in one lovely little package. And hell, we may even see that chip debut in the upcoming Xbox Scorpio. Wouldn't that be sweet? 
So while we do know that those chips will use DDR4 on the desktop and DDR5 on the Xbox Scorpio, there's even been rumors of the next generation APUs shipping with HBM2 memory on the same package, which would just be bonkers. Can you imagine a Zen-based CPU with GCN 4.0 at least cores, possibly a Vega-based GPU, with HBM2 memory on the same die package with direct access to memory? It would be absolutely glorious. But Anyway guys, I'm looking forward to all this stuff becoming more and more factual and clear and less speculation and extrapolation from some possibly valid benchmark results very soon. I will keep you guys in the know of course, but do me a favor and smack a little thumb on your screen in the meantime. I really appreciate you guys as always and I will see you in another creative cluster F of tech very soon in the next one. But until then, live it up, enjoy every minute of the day that you get and peace out.